Um, I'm Liz Hunter, I'm the Director of Policing and Violence and Place at the Combined Authority. Um, and just for everybody's benefit, those of you who are new, the reason for using the speakers is so you can hear each other, but also because that's when the live streaming will pan to you. So please do turn it on and off. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Graham. I'm the Cabinet Member for Regeneration on Wakefield Council. Hi, everybody. I'm Richard Butterfield. I'm the Partnership Team Leader for Historic England for Yorkshire. Tamsin Hart-Jones. I am um, the Head of In Homes England. Hi there, uh, Councillor Ben Burton from the City of York Council. Good morning, Stephen Moore. I'm the um, National Operations Manager for City Fibre. Hi, Rebecca Greenwood, Head of Housing at West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Uh, Hannah Andrew, I am the space, uh, Planning Policy Manager for Spatial Planning and Strategic Science for the Combined Authority. Hi, uh, Patrick Moore, I'm Head of Research and Intelligence at the Combined Authority. Hello everyone, I'm Helen Lennon, Chair of the West Yorkshire Housing Partnership. Ben Aspinall, Director of Aspinall Verdi, Private Sector Rep. Councillor Axel Shaw, Portfolio Holder for Regeneration, Planning and Transport on Bradford Council. Lisa Littlefair, City Director from Mont McDonald and Private Sector Representative. Scott Patient, Cabinet Member for Climate Action, Active Travel and Housing, Calderdale Council. Hi. Hi. Uh, Miles Larrington, Government Services Officer, West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Yeah. Sorry, I was getting a cup of tea. Councillor Helen Hayden, um, Executive Member for Sustainable Development and Infrastructure, Lee City Council. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Masood Ahmed and Kathy Elliott, Chair. Okay, item, oh, that's better. Um, <laughs> item six is the, um, we had the combined authority meeting on the 12th of October and the housing accelerator fund um, was, was followed up from the work of the housing revenue fund, was supported and went through the combined authority. So that's a really good news for, for, for our committee. And then um, the monitoring indicators. Um, Peter, I think you're going to take us through this. My apologies. These will be published in uh, State of the Region 2023. Um, the committee has previously received uh, uh, updates on these key metrics by exception. Uh, so at each of your committee meetings, there's a, a quite a detailed sort of overview of the latest information. Uh, but for, to aid sort of, uh, sort of reporting today, we've included all of the latest information and the key metrics which will be published 
in the State of the Region report, which we're hoping to publish at the end of this year. Uh, the one new bit of information which we need to bring to the committee's attention is information that was published around um, fuel poverty, and that information is contained in the report and sort of highlights the latest official information in respect of fuel poverty. The report outlines the definition of fuel poverty and the fact that it's influenced by three factors, uh, energy efficiency of houses, energy prices and incomes. Um, in terms of the information that we have, which is published uh, recently, um, we know that around 17% of households uh, in uh, uh, West Yorkshire are in fuel poverty. That's based on official statistics. That's higher than the national average of, of 13%. Um, that's around about 168,000 households. Um, it's higher than some parts of the country. Uh, so, for instance, it's higher than Greater Manchester, but it's slightly lower than West Midlands and, and uh, South Yorkshire. Um, there's not a great deal of variation at local level. The highest rates of fuel poverty based on official statistics are in Bradford, uh, but there's a very narrow range within which the other local authority sits. So typically, most local authorities sit within the range of 15 to 19% uh, uh, or 15 to 17% of households in fuel poverty. The official definition of fuel poverty in the official statistics, obviously, the information is time lagged. Uh, we, uh, as part of our work on cost of living and the monitoring we've been doing on supportive cost of living in response to that, we produced our own uh, estimates of, of uh, fuel poverty, uh, which are based on um, more, more up-to-date information, but use similar assumptions and based information provided by the Fuel Poverty uh, Alliance. And that suggests that at uh, its peak, uh, around about 36% of households in uh, West Yorkshire are in fuel poverty. That's since dropped to 30% currently, uh, we estimate. That's still a substantial number of households that we believe are in fuel poverty. That's around about 300,000 households. Um, the, obviously, a, a range of factors influence that, particularly energy prices, uh, uh, and obviously um, the backdrop to that is obviously over the last 12 months, as you know, has been set by, by some of the pricing decisions that have been made by, by, the, uh, by the energy regulator, uh, particularly in terms of the energy price cap uh, and the ending of support to households. Uh, in terms of what information we have at the national level, um, uh, mostly information that gives us insight on the kind of characteristics that then relate to fuel poor households, you know, for instance, you know, type of household uh, are all based on national data. Uh, so there's a summary in the report that highlights based on that latest national information what we what we know about some of the characteristics of those that are in fuel poor households. Uh, uh, households that uh, are in private rented accommodation tend to be more fuel poor. Single parent households as a household type are the, are the ones that experience the most fuel poverty. Ethnic minority households tend to have a greater risk of being in fuel poverty. Uh, um, but obviously, they're, 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 um, that's particularly because they, 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 there's a higher pro uh, propensity to, to, to live in social housing. Fuel poverty rates in England are typically uh, uh, higher amongst uh, uh, those containing people who have uh, a disabled impairment, uh, and households that are in uh, more, the more deprived areas of West Yorkshire are 50% more likely to, uh, to, to be in, in fuel poverty. So there are a range of different socioeconomic factors that, that, that actually influence that. Um, in terms of sort of the backdrop to where we are with energy prices at the moment, obviously uh, energy prices have been falling throughout throughout the year, uh, but obviously since uh, more recent events, sort of macroeconomic events, of uh, um, uh, uh, international uh, uh, prices for gas uh, have started to, to rise. So the uh, so for instance in the in the week immediately uh, after the sort of uh, incidents in the uh, in the Middle East, the uh, gas prices, effective gas prices, are used are traded here in the UK rose by 59%. Um, they're nowhere near the peak. Of where gas prices were trading uh, in December uh, 2022, um, but they're beginning to rise and they're beginning to rise quite quite sharply. So obviously, there will still be challenges for household incomes, particularly in terms of those cost pressures around fuel prices, and, uh, um, and it'll be interesting to see as well what kind of decisions the uh, the energy regulator 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 makes in terms of the price cap, if those macroeconomic conditions uh, continue. But there is still um, some um, some uh, clear volatility in the energy markets after after a long period where there's you know there's been a degree of stability in in those international markets. Uh, so there's some some volatilities as well. So there's still still factors that are influencing those those the uh, the supply side as well. Um, in the report as well, we touch on uh, what we're doing in response to that because if you say one of the ways that we can influence and we can respond to fuel poverty is by making households more energy efficient. Uh, so I don't know. Um, um, so in terms of the overview of what we've been doing on the Better Homes Hub, um, you, um, it's, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that we've been successful in securing uh, funding from the local energy advice demonstrator and that we've also uh, appointed a consortium led by the Energy Saving Trust uh, to, uh, to 
to be the client side support for the uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the better homes uh, hub. So. Um, so clearly we're making progress in that respect, and I'm, I'm not sure whether Rebecca or our colleagues you know, particularly want to add anything to, to that side of it as well. Um, so really, yeah, um, obviously the, uh, the report's accompanied by uh, a detailed slide pack. It overviews the kind of key information which we'll be publishing state of the region, which you know, uh, the committee takes responsibility for, and are uh, happy to take, take, take questions. Thanks very, thanks very much, Peter. Peter. Hello. Thanks, Chair. Um, two questions, to comments. Um, the fuel poverty is obviously very alarming, um, and West Yorkshire Housing Partnership members are very active in the Better Homes Hub and retrofit, but this is a long-term investment. It takes a lot of time, and um, so it's not a quick fix for people right now. And at the same time, we're also having to invest in starting to tackle the implications of climate change, so flood defences, increases in um, actual impacts in, in terms of infestations, or, or et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's it's trying to work out strategically what what can what else can we do in terms of fuel poverty in the shorter term, bearing in mind that retrofit is a it will affect a, a small number of people every year improving their um, their energy efficiency, but but not big numbers. Um, obviously, we're trying to tackle the worst first, but um, and then the second question is, how do uh, and maybe it's in the wider report? How do you link the this kind of data to outcome data that's available within the region in terms of educational outcomes or adult social care outcomes, so that we can actually see the impact of the cost of living crisis in terms of. Um, people's lives, but also other costs incurred? Yeah. Yeah, some good questions there. I'll try and take the difficult one first. Um, and, um, but it's a really good question. Um, it is a, a, a difficult area to, to, to link specifically fuel poverty to other, other outcomes. Um, but I think the, the key thing here is, is deprivation. We know that those households that are in more deprived areas tend to have sort of... Uh, lower um, education outcomes, they have a, a, a range of different sort of um, health challenges that they're facing compared to the areas that are more, more affluent, and also they tend to be fuel poor. There's a correlation between those combination of factors. Um, so I think that, so, so we do know a great deal about the kind of characteristics of those uh, households that are in the, in the more deprived areas. And uh, we do have some insights from the from the census of population recently. They give us some, some insights and some of those challenges. It's a little, it's a little bit difficult to link all of those things together or specifically attribute it to uh, you know to 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 to, to fuel poverty. So um, we 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 know, we know that sort of good housing. Um, we, we you know if you if you reflect on, on on where we were when we came out of the health crisis, we know there was a link between housing and housing type and housing tenure. Mm -hmm. And um, people's propensity to be, um, you know, to, to be exposed to, you know, to, you know, um, to, to, the, um, to the virus. Um, so, so, so we know there is a clear link there as well. You know, so sort of quality, type, nature of ten years are quite important. And um, you know, so I think the sort of it's not just about housing efficiency; it's about the quality of the housing stock. Mm -hmm. It's about what we do to, um, you know, so the sort of the broader ambition we've got to build more houses, to build more affordable houses. I think that that's the single biggest challenge that, 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 that we face. We know we've got a housing market at the moment, perhaps isn't working in the way we would like it to, uh, and, and again, those are sort of sort of policy choices that perhaps are a little bit beyond sort of the sort of combined authority. But I think our focus on building more houses, more um, and, and and houses that, that, that meet current building regulations and current building standards, you know, will address some of those those, those those other outcomes. But at the same time, you know, I think we had a discussion at last committee meeting about how we incentivise developers to build above the, the, the minimum requirement, say, for EPC um, yeah, um, yeah, certification at sea level. You know, how do, how do, how do we get them above, 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 that, above, above that level? So it's, again, it's how we incentivize developers to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my answer on, on, on that one. Um, and on the first question, I'm not sure I've answered the first question, but it was, it kind of, it was more generally, wasn't it, about sort of, you know, there are a range of sort of macroeconomic challenges that, that, that we face, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, in, in some senses, you, you know, um, you know, in terms of, of tackling or retrofitting, yet we're addressing a certain certain aspects of of of, of, of the, those wider set of conditions. But I, I think it, I think it's I think it's, it needs to be seen in the context of all the other things that we're doing in building more affordable housing. I think is, mm -hmm. is you know, I think I think that would be my answer.
Me to hand over to, to Rebecca, if that's okay. Thanks, Richard. Some of that's in the housing strategy um, paper as well. So in West Yorkshire, I think it's, I've written it down in my notes for my paper, but I think it's about 33% of our stock is pre-1919, um, which is higher than the England average. Um, one of the things that we're doing through Better Homes Hub is looking at area-based schemes, which look at testing different ways of retrofitting homes in different types of properties and across different tenures. So the aim is to have a pilot scheme across each of the local authorities and a paper was discussed by Climate Committee on Tuesday uh, in more detail around that. Um, so I think um, we recognise that as a huge challenge and the idea is across the area-based schemes with different approaches to tackling that will help give us some of those, those insights into how we deal with that. Um, so that's probably a short answer that we don't have all the answers but are working across some of our programmes to look at the different different ways we can address that but particularly interested in the work that you're doing and linking that in I think Richard would be really helpful for, for the yeah, panel on that. We've got a big focus on this obviously. Item, uh, item 8, digital blueprint update. I think you're going to take us through this. Yeah, that's me. I think I'm sharing your mic. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've brought a few papers to you on digital. So this one is, um, again, seeking your views on our emerging West Yorkshire digital blueprint. Um, so the blueprint will replace the Leeds City Region digital framework that was developed in 2019, Having a plan for the digital economy that better reflects the central role digital plays in our lives is crucial for the region. So it will help us boost productivity, reduce skills gaps and shortages, improve our connectivity, make us attractive for investment and improve the lives of everyone who lives and works here. So it's intended that the new blueprint will take us up to 2030. So the overarching aim um, in the blueprint is a productive, thriving, sustainable digital landscape in West Yorkshire. And that's underpinned by um, digitally empowered people, digitally enabled places and digitally thriving businesses. So those are described as horizontal elements in your paper. There's then um, a number of focus areas or themes being proposed for the emerging blueprint. And those are described as verticals in the paper. Um, they're all listed out in the paper, but I will go through them because I think we're looking today for your kind of feedback on these and, and, and whether there's anything missing um, as well as some discussion about um, the wider opportunities that digital brings. So the themes are showcase um, the digital opportunities the region has to offer, ensure that we're benefiting from advanced technologies, tackling digital exclusion, understanding and using data to make West Yorkshire a well-connected digital destination ensuring that digital technologies make day-to-day -day life easier for West Yorkshire residents and businesses, establishing digital as a method to help West Yorkshire tackle the climate emergency, and then collaborative working of digital stakeholders in West Yorkshire. So the paper details some of the engagement that's already been undertaken, and it also explains that there is an interface with the health tech strategy that's in development, and that those two strategies combine support the sector focus for our emerging investment zone in the region, which we've talked to you about briefly before. So we have this week launched a survey to collate some information from the public that will help inform the strategy as it emerges. Um, we can circulate the link to that. We'd be grateful for you to um, pass that through your networks. It's on the Combined Authorities Your Voice pages and it went live this week. But today we're seeking views from the committee at this early stage of development of the blueprint. There are a number of questions that are set out at paragraph 2.11. So the first are a couple of questions just on the scope and structure that I've just talked through. In particular, are there any key themes that are missing? And given your committee um, focus on place and infrastructure, are there any particular spatial issues that we think need to be considered? And then there are a set of broader questions around the challenges and opportunities. So what could the role of advanced digital technology be in our town and city and rural areas? How can the public sector stimulate and accelerate commercial digital infrastructure rollout in rural or hard to reach areas in particular? What are the challenges of digital exclusion from a place and infrastructure perspective and how can we start to tackle those? And how should the availability of resources and capacity to deliver the blueprint's aspirations be considered. So I'll, I'll pause there and pass back to you, Chair, um, to invite reflections and, and ideas, please. Yeah. 
Um, who's going to go first? Right. <laughs> I'll leave this one. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Chair. I, I I think it's excellent that we're you know we're really grasping the nettle with this and moving in you know and, and having a you know positive um, a plan and move forward with it. I think it's it's a complicated area, so identifying clear gaps is, is sometimes difficult because it's constantly evolving. I think I just set the example that, because you mentioned the rural question, so to, to, to put it into context, if, you're, if you live rurally or in an area where there is bad uh, connectivity broadly on the, and the latter are the most expensive areas to reach, let's put it that way, then you might not connect, get connectivity to your homes, your schools, your businesses for into 2030. So if you imagine somebody going through schooling at that point, you're, you're going to be immediately uh, uh, back-footed compared to, to all your peers. So having a plan of, of this, and having it out and, and having it evolve, uh, I think is a, uh, is a hugely important step forward. And I, I uh, welcome this. I think it's not in respect of any gaps, but just to focus on what can we do to, to support investment? What can we do to make it easier to invest? Uh, we know the market is very difficult. We know it's very competitive. Uh, we know that we want to get people off copper and onto full fiber. So there's some big themes that we know we, we need to do. And it's just how, as, a, you know, as a, a, a district, how can we get behind that and support both the, the public sector programs as well as the private sector investment? Thanks for that, Stephen. Um, anyone else? Scott. Thank you, Chair. Um, and yeah, while we're talking about rural locations, I'm sure we've all got our rural places in our boroughs, but um, I guess for us, the current challenge is um, the withdrawal and investment in build by City Fibre um, within, within Calderdale. I know that's not just sort of unique for us. Um, and I know the blueprint wants us to stimulate and accelerate rollout, um, but investors are withdrawing um, as, as, as kind of part of that. Um, I'm just wondering how we can support in those challenges um, might, might enable us to sort of push back a little bit against some of that perceived lack of investment. Uh, so I think... In terms of um, a, a disinvestment, we still have a broad plan for for investment. Uh, I think the overall, as a as a as an industry, it's it is about what we can do to get over off copper and onto full fibre. You know, I think the market is still uh, uh, confused at the moment, so there's a lot of work to be to be done with that. And the more support that that we can can be provided on the ground is you know uh, is hugely important. We also have to look at there is an emerging change in terms of how we go from outside in as well as inside out with, in, with investments. So we have to be careful that we're not duplicating. We want to minimise overbuild, and this is across the whole borough. It's not, you know, it's not a city fibre uh, question. It's, a, it's about a whole sector. So there is a big piece of work to do with um, uh, with that and, the, and, and how we get to that 100% and get everybody covered. So I think there is, it's a, it is a challenging time at the moment, and the more local authority, regional authority can, can support in that, we'll see the end goal achieved. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, just, just an observation, I suppose, and it, and it sort of relates to what's already been said, is just the questions about availability of resources and capacity, and about, I suppose... The industry that needs to support this. Um, are, are, we, are you talking with the industry as a whole to be able to answer some of those questions? Because so, I think, with respect, probably only Stephen around the table can answer those, some of those questions. Um, is, is, that, is that something that's happening? Um, yes, yes, we are um, through a variety of means, less formally than through through committees. But yes, we've got those links into the into the networks. Hello. Thanks, Chair. Um, so in the answer to the question, uh, is it clear and logical? It was logical and clear even to me, <laughs> who knows very little about this. Um, and regarding the spatial aspect, it is what Stephen said about 
trying to um, ensure that we don't have left behind places because they will tend to be, if you link it to the housing strategy, um, compounded with people who maybe don't have great access to public transport and um, are in other ways deprived. So we don't want to, we don't want this to grow inequality. We'd like to actually use this to uh, shorten that gap. Um, and there was there was comment in there about you know what do businesses need. So I was thinking about it in terms of my own organisation, and in terms of the challenges, data, <laughs> data, how to use and manage it because there's vast amounts of data, growing amounts of data, um, and linking that to external data within the region as well. So I think that's the collaborate bit, isn't it? How we can actually collaborate and use that strategically to actually make the best use of our resources um, and develop you know future strategies and plans smart tech in housing um, which is a growing uh, issue um, it's quite expensive to roll out but also it generates more data <laughs> so we've got more data to manage and how do we deal with that um, the role of artificial intelligence and the risks involved because again that's it's a rapidly growing area and um, actually it's a bit like how we're trying to collaborate in terms of development and in terms of retrofit. Actually, collaborating around this very complex area probably would be very beneficial to lots of businesses and help them understand it and grow it in the region. Um, Cybersecurity, ever present, and how do we protect ourselves against that? And um, the digital access and skills, keeping, making it affordable and keeping it up to date in a rapidly changing world. So they were just the things that immediately came to me. Thanks for that, Helen. Um, anyone else? Jasmine. Thank you. Just built on um, Helen's point there around the spatial dynamic, I think there's a real opportunity, isn't there? And, and just thinking about um, the strategic place partnership and the focus areas that we've identified and the spatial priority areas that, um, that the, the combined authority has identified. It feels to me that digital infrastructure has to be seen as part of that broad infrastructure package when we're um, when we're thinking about, and particularly in the inclusion space. Um, and I, I just wondered, on the spatial side of things, will the blueprint seek to identify some of those kind of focus areas? I guess, and it'd be great, wouldn't it, if they also aligned with some of the already identified spatial priorities, so that digital infrastructure could be part of that broader infrastructure when we're speaking about regional relations? Um, I think it's still to be determined. I think we're still at the stage where we're scoping out, hence the question about what we think the, the link is and spatially how far the, the blueprint needs to go. But yeah, welcome your reflections. Thank you. Ben. Thanks. I, I, my comment is really about the fact that I think that the network needs to be ubiquitous. I'm not sure we should be prioritising areas over other areas. I think it needs to be across the piece, across the whole of West Yorkshire, and not just in residential properties as well, but the business properties. And I think there's an, an exclusion of business properties in certain locations as well to, uh, to, to technology. So um, I, think, I, I, think that's, I think that's quite quite key and then the, the second point is really about training I think uh, the, the top training and development in, in at all levels whether it be in schools and as Stephen said not leaving anybody behind in, in, in schools and colleges but then right through to the more advanced use of artificial intelligence and so on mm. I think you need you need that that, that, that again a sort of ubiquitous skill set as well I think Um, yeah, I have two points. Um, I guess on the, the data element, as he was saying, I think a little bit that <coughs> making sure it's all the data that we, other organisations, ourselves, uh, are creating is open sourced and all of the learning that we develop is open source, especially with using the combined authorities data so that people can actually use and interact with that as we develop tools to take that forwards because you don't want to kind of develop inside of a kind of closed off system. So I think making sure that where we're supporting organisations want to encourage them for that learning to be shared, and that's kind of a communication strategy as much as anything else. Um, 
and anyone in place, I think it's just important that making sure that universities are involved in this heavily because they're going to be the big incubators of new technology that's coming through. And it's about how does place capture and support those as new technologies come through? How can we support those from a place perspective to grow with businesses and spin off opportunities in the area as well? Uh, yeah, I um, I think on the skills thing, there's also a wider point because there's at the, we're we're almost sort of the equivalent of the industrial revolution in in digital. You know, that's the place we are. And I've done a lot of out and about talking to schools and to pupils, colleges, universities. And I think the one thing I would say is that skills are important, but also ambition is getting getting an understanding in the schools from the earliest age that that this is an opportunity for them and, and the the uh, this will this can support their ambition and create roles that they haven't even seen and their teachers and parents haven't haven't seen, and I think it's that seismic shift. That, if it was something that would concern me, the, the ubiquitous infrastructure, I think, is absolutely right. You know, getting it everywhere, whoever's providing it, getting getting it out there. But I think there's also, from a city or region perspective, because others are pushing in this as well. You know, this is a national program, but is but is saying, look, let's let's get on the front foot and embed that ambition to understand with those peoples that, that this is going to change because I think that's, that isn't out there. I think there are skills programs and other things to, 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 to train and educate, but the impression I get from the schools is even in curriculum and other things, there is, it's, it's creeping in, it's not. You know, it's sort of pace of infrastructure now is doing this, but actually the pace of ambition and the pace of understanding is a heck of a lot slower. So even though the skills will, will be behind, actually, the ambition and understanding that, that, that life is going to change for the better it is actually needs a lot of work as well. Helen, just to build on that, um, because you know, obviously I'm very rightly concentrated on schools and that's where, but I think there's, um, in this strategy, there needs to be a kind of understanding of how this needs to be communicated, but to the entire population, and I'm talking about people who may be a bit wary and frightened of this. The word ubiquitous was mentioned. That's not going to be a good thing, or, or, or you know, a positive element for a lot of people um, living in West Yorkshire and across West Yorkshire. And when terms like you know AI and and things like that, um, communicating the benefits of this and and uh, you know in terms of um, potential harms, I think, is um, is going to be a really um, difficult thing to do, and um, it is for all of uh, all of us who are not in the industry, um, and from a layperson's point of view. So, kind of getting that um, communication and really listening to people and their fears, and um, and that, as well as their ambitions around this. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I think Alison, you've had a. A good few comments back to take on board. Uh, the recommendation is set out at 10.1 uh, that we provide feedback and endorse the direction of the digital blueprint ahead of the full drafting. Are we all agreed with that? Okay, thanks very much. Um, item, item nine is the housing strategy. Rebecca, are you going to take us through this? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so... Some members of the committee will have seen this before and commented on it at various occasions, but I'm just mindful that others are perhaps new to the committee, so I haven't been here when we had our private discussion last time. So I just wanted to give a bit of background as to where we are with this and why we're, why we're coming forward with a um, draft housing strategy today. Um, so our last housing vision document um, in West Yorkshire was the Leeds City Region Housing Vision in 2019, um, which prioritised the development of well-connected neighbourhoods, creating good places to live, and whilst that ambition largely still stands, there's been some significant changes um, since then. Not least the devolution deal, the election of the mayor, um, changing our geography, Homes England working much more closely with us and the launch of our strategic place partnership, and then more broadly, the cost of living crisis, inflation and other economic challenges. So timing for this strategy feels right now to be doing something different and to be bringing all those different factors that play into one space to say what our, what our ambition is for housing in West Yorkshire. <clears throat> so I 
what we've done with this strategy is it's got three particular pillars that have informed it. The first one being that it's evidence-led. So we started this by commissioning some specific evidence-based work, also worked with Patrick's team on things that we monitor and understand about our housing market and housing delivery in West Yorkshire. Second is around partnerships. So we've got some really well-established partnerships in West Yorkshire. I've mentioned the one with Homes England. We've got West Yorkshire Housing Partnership. We've got good relationships with Historic England, with our private sector and others. So we've done a huge amount of stakeholder engagement up to this point on what the objectives are. And then thirdly is where we're wanting to hopefully move to after today to make sure that the challenges and the outcomes that we're proposing are things that people in West Yorkshire recognise. So we're hoping to go out to an public consultation following committee and following taking on board committee's comments on where we are today as to what people think about the challenges we've identified and the outcomes we want to achieve. So really from today what we're looking for is to seek any comments from committee members but also your agreement to go out to do that consultation in the run-up to Christmas. I'm not going to go through there's quite a lot of detail in the slides but I was just going to touch on each of the objectives and um, for members just some of the background and some of the outcomes that we want to achieve. So the, the ambition of the strategy is to create safe and inclusive places to live that meet the needs of our residents by working together to deliver sustainable and affordable homes in well-connected neighbourhoods where people choose to live and ensuring that West Yorkshire is a place that we're proud to call home. And I think we felt that word proud was quite important to make sure that people have pride in place. So the West Yorkshire plan says that West Yorkshire is a place where people can make a home. But for the housing strategy, that's got to be somewhere where people actually are proud to say is their home. So under that, we've identified four objective areas that are guided by two principles, which equally align to the West Yorkshire plan. One is sustainability, which of course includes our net zero ambitions, but also more broadly is sustainability of place, linking into our ambitions around our transport network, active travel, etc., and the quality and public realm that surrounds our places and makes people want to live in those neighbourhoods. The second is around equality, diversity and inclusion. Again, that underpins our West Yorkshire plan and feeds through into our housing strategy. And we have a real theme, hopefully, that you'll notice if you've read the slides throughout the objectives around ensuring we're supporting some of those left behind communities, as you were mentioning on other items, Helen, um, and ensuring that where we are investing is not just those places that continue to grow, but we can make that equitable across, across West Yorkshire. So those two things underpin each of our, each of our objectives. So the first objective around is boosting the supply of the right homes in the right places. Some people might find that a bit of a cliche statement if you work in the housing world. Um, However, we feel that through the strategy, we're starting to identify what that actually means. So we know collectively across West Yorkshire, by aggregating up requirements in local plans, there's a need for 9,000 new homes per year. We also know that's really challenging, um, in particular in certain parts of our market where land values are low and there's really challenging land issues. So through our strategic place partnership, working with our local authorities on their local plans, working on schemes like the Housing Accelerator Fund that was recently approved and Brownfield Housing Fund, um, we're, we're obviously seeking to support that and support development in places where the market is unable to deliver for various reasons, and that is a key ambition for us. The strategic place partnership identifies 16 focus area projects, which underpin a lot of that work and a lot of the work we're doing with Tamsin's team at Homes England, these are large strategic allocations, but also allocations where there's huge infrastructure requirements and a need for joined up work in between public and private sector to realise their delivery. So we're on that journey on some of those projects far more advanced than others, but I think this, this strategy helps to underpin where some of our focus is going to be across West Yorkshire. Um, so the second objective is to improve the quality of our homes and neighbourhoods. As I said, this encompasses investment in the quality of existing homes, but our, our places as well. So we know we've got a need to retrofit 680,000 homes to support our net zero housing ambitions. We also know, I got the stats wrong earlier, Richard, it's 23% of our stock are, <laughs> are um, pre-1919, but still higher than the England average. And we actually know that we have a lower than average number of properties that are an EPC of a CR above across West Yorkshire. So we've got some real challenges in our region. A lot of the work that we're doing through Better Homes Hub and a commissioning now is starting to un unpick some of that and, and develop that working with partners again to do so. But also the quality of place is important. So one of the things through the strategy that we're talking about is how we can work across our local authorities to look at what good quality design means for us in West Yorkshire and how far can we actually make that simpler for our private sector community that we can talk with one voice across West Yorkshire about what that really means. Third objective, to increase the 
increase the supply of truly affordable homes. And I believe one of the biggest challenges for us in West Yorkshire is due to the low value of our areas. We're often characterised as an affordable, affordable region to live. However, that completely misses cost of living factors, the cost of transport, the cost to heat our inefficient homes and the, the communities that are actually on lower incomes, which we have a higher proportion of in our region. <clears throat> so research that we commissioned ourselves in 2020-21 found that 28% of private sector residents in West Yorkshire couldn't afford £500 per calendar month of rent and couldn't afford to buy a property of £100,000. That was before cost of living crisis. So those statistics, if we were to redo that study, my, my thought would be they'll have increased and got more difficult for people. Our focus that's been driven by, by the Mayor has been around increasing the supply of affordable homes to tackle that, given some of the regulatory requirements around private rented sector are, are driven nationally. We seek to influence that, but what we really want to see is a boosting of affordable housing delivery. However, through our strategy, we also need to recognise that the private rented sector is growing, and that is in line with national trends. So there's more work that we can do collectively in West Yorkshire and looking at our, our partner combined authorities to, to work with the private rented sector and the private market to make sure that we're improving the quality um, and affordability of private, se private sector properties. Finally, uh, the last objective, but not least, is creating homes that meet the needs of communities. Um, so this, this objective particularly draws on uh, the relationship between housing and health recognising that um, we've got an ageing population, despite having a young population base in West Yorkshire that is, that is ageing. This has been driven by some of the Mayor's work on the Dementia Ready Housing Task Force, but also by the Housing and Health Network in West Yorkshire. And there's a real correlation in national statistics between the quality of housing and people's health and life expectancy outcomes. It also recognises the challenges that we've got in homelessness and the further work we can do across West Yorkshire and across all partners and local authorities to support that building on things that are happening in other parts of other parts of the country and other devolved areas to look at best practice and how we can apply some of that to West Yorkshire. Particularly keen to say on that point, that is in support of, any, of our local authorities, enabling a lot of the good work that's already happening locally. This is where we could add value to that and where we can, where we can share what's happening um, between partners and learn from each other. Um, so they're, they're the far key objectives. As I say, what, what I'm particularly seeking today, this isn't a final strategy document. Um, I'm always of the belief that you should take something out to consultation with the space still to influence and shape it. This is about setting out a context of what our role is for people, where we see the challenges and where we think we can improve in outcomes via this strategy and some of the delivery that will come from it. So particularly interested in comments on, on what, you've, what you've read from committee members and then looking for hopefully agreement to go out to public consultation um, ahead of Christmas. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that. Um, right, comments. Ben? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I particularly liked the uh, slide today in the strategy. It's on page 55 of the plan, pack, of the report pack, page 57 of the PDF, with the sort of the role of the combined authority. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that was really helpful to understand how this strategy kind of fits in with obviously all the local plans and work of local authority of partners and I think um, I think maybe more could be made of that a little bit more because I think that the, the sort of the, the bullet points that, that have been put there about the things that you can do levering more funding I think getting more maybe devolution of power for the local authority for the, for the combined authority, sorry, will only enable delivery and particular strategic priority areas and so on and so forth, where there's fun, funding is needed and all these things we need for infrastructure. I think the more the strategy can aid the credibility of the combined authority, then you can have, it'll facilitate that conversation upwards to government, I think. I think that's where it's, I think that's the role perhaps even more so than, 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 than sort of looking downwards to the, to the delivery, looking upwards to the powers and the, and the funding. So if we can emphasise that, I'd be really uh, in favour of that. And then perhaps then when you're looking at the objectives and the measuring performance, um, I think it's quite a lot of, lot of 
sort of measuring points there. And if they can be, if they, I would be in favour of slimming those down so that you can sort of be very clear, right? Well, we we have delivered on the mayor's targets of X number of houses, so many affordable houses, so many net zero houses, or you know, building rate future home standard compliant houses and so on and so forth. We've retrofitted so many houses. So uh, it, you, you've just got those, you only need two or three headlines to say, yeah, we, look, we're delivering, give us more money and more, more power kind of thing. That's my, my take on it. But otherwise, yeah, good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a, a couple of, of observations me it was interesting when we talked about the statistics because something that I didn't pick out when I read it but was I reframed it from the statistics at the front so if we look at uh, rental I think you said is increasing so the volume of rental is increasing that cost of living crisis uh, the cost of living is increasing I'm also aware that um, aren't the rules changing in terms of EPCs for rental properties in for 2025 and 2028, I think there's a thing that says you've now got to be C or above uh, for rental. So I'm just wondering how that scopes into it and and whether or not we know that, that uh, uh, if you like, landlords are going to be prepared to continue in uh, the sort of the, the model of, you know, one or two rentals, smaller rental businesses, not, you know, not larger ones. But I, I think that's that's something that would need to be uh, in scope a bit because I think that could have a big impact certainly on both as reaching those targets but also if people are no longer renting and then those properties are sold they're either sold and not available to rent or people who buy them will have a higher cost of living if they're able to afford it and then the other point was um, with all the figures in there which always sound excellent I'm, I'm always mindful of CITB's challenge in relation to the volume of skills building what we need to to actually roll out because that has I've seen that just almost exponentially increase the, the shortage of, um, of construction skills over the last kind of decade it's been you know I think it was 100,000 or something it's now 200 just shy of 300,000 I think in the region so uh, I think there's a point in there to go yes we've got these ambitions but actually to get there do we have the right skills in the right areas to get us where we need to go. Thank you. I've just come back on just a couple of those points, if that's okay, Chair. I think um, on the Mr. Sunak scrapped that in his in his carbon speech, the minimum energy efficiency standards. Oh, However, okay. our Better Homes Hub still retains that ambition. So I think it's still a, a relevant point to what we're talking about in our strategy. So um, we do need to strengthen that. And I think through the Better Homes Hub, that's some of the work that we're doing to, to strengthen our approach to that. And skills, um, Liz and I had a conversation just last week to say that is an element that we need to pick up and we, that needs to be reflected more. So it's on the, I think for this, but before committee papers came out, um, it wasn't in there, but it is something that's kind of on the log that we need to pick that up, particularly I think around green skills. And Helen might, might come in on this. West Church Housing Partnership have specifically talked about that through their climate work stream. Um, and the commission that we've got with Energy Savings Trust also includes, um, through Better Homes, also includes some research in terms of the skills for green skills, but more broadly skills in construction and, and other industries. We do recognise that there is a there is a, a growing skills gap. So um, I completely agree it's, it's not reflected in this, this set, but hopefully that gives you comfort that it's something that we're picking up in terms of developing the strategy. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was really to, to echo what, what Ben said around sort of how, how this is measured. Um, there's some really, really great ambition in there and great ideas and things that, that want to be done. I think it, it would be important to focus that and, and if you can, put some numbers against it, actually, to go, this is what we're, this is what we're going to do. But I appreciate you still, you still in, a, in a stage like that. But And also, I, I was considering some of these things are quite intangible when you look at it, you go, Okay, working with partners to support residents to feel safer in their communities, who would, wouldn't agree with that? But what does that look like? What does what does good look like? Can we get some examples in there? I don't know. I, I'm understanding that this is a strategic document and its, it's purpose is to be quite high level, but it would be nice to get something we can really put your teeth into. 
Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd really endorse that and, and kind of build on that. And thank you, and um, Clemson, for coming to see us at Calderdale. And I know that officers working with the Strategic Place Officers Group have sort of played into that. I think I think how you sell it and what the what it looks like is going to be a key part of that. So I, I mean, really pleased. Obviously, I, I would be for seeing the support for active travel developments and that idea about place. I think we're all trying to do active travel in our own places, but it feels a little bit piecemeal. Like, what does it look like? How do they join up with each other? You know, Leeds, you know, Bradford, Calderdale. What what do the corridors look like, and how does that feel? So that and some of the bits that have just been alluded to now about improved neighbourhood safety and some of those other elements, how that read through looks like when you're trying to sell it to people is going to be absolutely key. I'd just be keen to hear about what you think that might look like. So appreciate there's a million different ways of doing engagement and consultation. So if you manage to thread that needle and do it perfectly, that's going to be massive. Well, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. Thank you. Um, I think the point where we are, and I, I recognise that, I think the point where we are is we're looking for endorsement of have we got the right challenges and are we aiming in the right direction with outcomes, which I think you rightly point out who's going to say no to some of that. Um, so looking for things that we may have missed, I think following this comes the implementation plan. So what we've not had previously is a direction of travel to the things that we're doing and the things are prioritising in, at a West Yorkshire level and as a collective of five local authorities within that. So it's seeking to, to build on what's already in local housing strategies to an extent, but also to define, as you and um, Ben both pointed out, what our role is in that space as an enabler, as a strategic influencing partner, and as a partner as well through some of our other work that, that seeks to influence the wider economy as well. So that's why the mayoral box kind of spreads across those things. And recognising what all that does is enables actual delivery of some of these things which generally is led by our local authorities private and third sector um, so I think we can build on that and build on that narrative um, and then I'd be sort of keen I think rolling on from this that this committee helps us develop some of that implementation plan and thinking about how that supports the activity that's happening but what more we can do to, to learn from each other and others um, as well which I think we already do a lot a lot of which we've tried to bring out and can bring out bring out more um, and we did talk, sort of already have a bit of a conversation about, um, I'm not a massive fan of case studies, but kind of those in a box sort of things that are happening around things like community-led housing or, or in different sectors where we know that there's really good practice and how can we how can we actually alleviate some of those barriers and support it? Richard? <coughs> yeah, just a uh, really nice piece of work, good piece of work, uh, Rebecca, and um, I think the coverage is, is, is brilliant, really. Um, just picking up on Ben's point, I think those connections with other strategies and other aspects of you know making a really great place and other place making agenda, I think is something that we need to be mindful of without diluting the housing focus. It's all those connections that really make uh, these kind of initiatives um, successful. I think we've got quite a few probably fairly generic um, challenges and ambitions in there. And I think just coming on from Lisa's point, having some more of that sort of local distinctiveness and those particular kind of character issues and challenges uh, it would be great to see that coming through um, more strongly um, in in the piece and just specifically on a couple of those you mentioned um, in your um, opportunities part about the industrial towns and uh, and so on they also create some challenges as well because we've got all of that vacant property on upper floors um, that feels like um, a, you know a challenge where we've got you know development funding gaps, um, particularly with the kind of relatively low um, you know um, returns on investment for, for investing in, in places like that. And really, how do we, we solve that? And one generic issue that we're interested in, of course, you know, is the kind of mills mill sites, those larger vacant properties which it would be brilliant to bring more of those back into um, use for residential or other purposes but they have particular challenges uh, and issues associated with them and I think all of the authorities in in West Yorkshire have uh, clusters of, of mills that are lying dormant or, or underused at the moment which would be really great to kind of see some of some of that I suppose coming coming through in the in the ambitions which are really sort of characterful and distinctive for our local area as well. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
I think the strategy, which, you know, obviously, because West Yorkshire has a partnership, we were part of the consultation process. We very much endorse it. Uh, and I think it helps turn something that, as Stephen said about digital, is very complex into something that's quite, well, much easier to understand. And I think the conversation we so far around the table has indicated the complexities of actually trying to create a regional housing strategy. And as I've said before at this committee, in almost 40 years of working in social housing, this is the most challenging time we've ever had. So the more that we can have a strategy where it sets out some, some goals that we can all collaborate around, work towards and achieve, well, hopefully achieve, the better, particularly to also influence government and their agenda. So picking up on the skills point, uh, yeah, that was, that was an area that I've also identified when I read the whole thing again, that probably we could make more of because there is a, a, a skill shortage in development, in retrofit, in maintenance, in planning, which we've talked about several times at this committee. And if we can actually build something more clearly into the strategy, that would be really helpful. What we're doing as a partnership, as an example, is we're trying to, act, we've, we've worked on a development pipeline, we're also now trying to start work on a retrofit pipeline so that we can show the market there's a lot of investment potential out there. We can work with colleges to actually set the courses up, to actually develop the market, develop the supply chain, and I think that probably can come out a bit more as well in terms of that. But yes, I think it's a really good piece of work. Thank you. Um, similar to Helen, we've um, had a real opportunity to help to shape the document and testament to uh, Rebecca and, and her team for all the hard work here. I think it is a, a, a really good document. I think the thing from the outset for me had been um, making sure that it demonstrated, and I'm really glad Ben you saw that, the power of the combined authority and that, that it wasn't just a collection of um, individual strategies, it's what's the added value at the combined authority level and I think for me that enabling role is incredibly important and we talked about skills and I think also really the, the key to it will be thinking about kind of the next step, that implementation plan and the join up across the combined authority and all the different roles that you have and I'm particularly thinking the relationship of this strategy to other strategies, particularly in the transport space, the opportunity around mass transit how do those strategies all join up into one to create you know, successful quality places? So I just think it's a, it's a huge opportunity and great that it's, it's laid out in terms of what does the housing element of that mean. Anyone else? Yeah, just I think I'd just follow up on that because I think there is a... It just struck me, I, I, I think one of the challenges that we have as well is if we can have an ambition, which I think this is great, but then if you're a, a developer, the first thing you meet is going to be planning and bureaucracy and all of those elements that you meet as a developer that you, you're faced with, those advanced payment code notices, your section 38s, 106s, etc. So I think it's also a big piece into with that economic development role that, that uh, we have so strong here to, to sort of say, comes back to the early point I think with digital but it's about how, how are you going to support the developers why how are we doing it better than you know Sheffield Manchester wherever why is it easier to invest in West Yorkshire and build your homes and, and uh, uh, here than it is to build somewhere else I think you know don't underestimate that that piece because from an inward investment point of view the minimum the more barriers you can knock out the better and more likely you know, the quicker they can, they can get built, the more hand-holding and support. And, it, and I, I can't underestimate, uh, sorry, underemphasize the, uh, the, the, the importance of having that relationship with those senior, with the local authority, the support of the and combined authority. You know, we know it's going to be rough, it's going to be highs and there's going to be lows, but we support you to invest in, in this region. I think it's really important. Anyone else? I think that's been a really, a really good, a really good debate, and some good issues have come forward. And, and I do thank you for the work that you've done on this. It's a great piece of work for you and your colleagues. And I think the support that we've got from all the people around the room is brilliant. So 
Thanks very much for that. So, can we agree the recommendations on 10.1, 10.2? Okay. Um, and then the date of the next meeting seems a long way off, <laughs> uh, 29th of February. Um, but uh, I'm sure it'll come round very quickly. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for your attendance today. <clears throat> we were concerned, uh, Liz and I, about uh, lack of attendance from local authorities. So it's good to see that you've all turned up today. Um, the private sector do support this committee a lot, and it's up to us as elected members um, to support it also. So it's good to see everybody. We'll just have a five-minute break, and then we're going to the...